Well, once again, good morning, Calvary. Hey, so glad you're here. Grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25 is where we'll be today. We're in a series of messages that we are calling Reverse Engineering. We're talking about how do we design the life that we want to live. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, an interesting subject that I think hits all of us in some different ways. We're going to talk about work today. Anybody, anybody ever remember that, that show or seen any episodes of that show, Dirty Jobs? Do you remember that show? Yeah. Right? There's a couple that always stick in my head. If you weren't familiar with a guy named Mike Rowe, would go and he would do these, these, these jobs that, that they're, just, they're just dirty jobs. And often things you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about somebody having to do that. Cleaning windows on a skyscraper is one that always stuck to me. And cleaning out septic tanks seemed especially fitting for dirty jobs. And uh, you, you think about work and it hits us in a lot of different ways. Anybody remember your first job? Anybody remember your worst job? Yeah, your worst boss? I, I, I told a story in first service, I won't go into the whole thing, but I worked in a bookstore when I was in high school. A friend of ours owned a bookstore, and uh, I would work there after school, and there was a day when a guy dressed up like a priest came in and stole a Bible. <laughs> Do you ever have those moments where you go, I didn't expect to see that at work today? Anybody? Right? They're the things that happen. So we're going we're gonna to talk about work. We're also going to use a little tool that we used last week to, to help us talk about and look at these things a little bit. We, we kind of used a, a matrix, if you would, here that helped us. And we'll come back to this a little bit again today. Kind of four areas or four seasons that we might see in our lives. Sometimes we're in, a, we're in a time of grace. Sometimes we're in a time of growth. We talked about how some seasons of our lives feel flat, and some of them feel as though we are failing. And so we looked at those, and we'll actually come back and look at this a little bit more as we talk and as we go through things again here today. Why are we talking about work? Because we're, we're also going to talk about our families. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about parenting. We're, we're going to talk about our finances. We're going to talk about the church. We're going to look at some, some different areas. Why talk about work well, the typical person who works eight hours a day will work about 90,000 hours in their lifetime. That's a third of your life. So if you spend a third of your life on something, and for some of us, you say a third of my life, I would love for it only to be a third of my life. Don't you think it's important for us to talk about? The reality is when we talk about our work, for many of us, it's the cause of our purpose, our prosperity, our stress, our joy, our anger, our fulfillment. And when we talk about work, and I think this is important today, we talk about it in different seasons, right? Because for some of you, when I say work, your work right now is actually school. Like what you're doing, what, what's in front of you that God has given you to do, what's in your hands to do, is actually a season of school or preparation. So, so that's your work. For some of you, you might say, well, well I don't work I stay at home and I take care of children. Believe me, that's work. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right, some of you are in a stay at home season that that's the work that God has put in your hands to do. Some of you are in a unique transition season, right? Maybe you're looking for a job or maybe you're looking for a new job or maybe you have retirement on the horizon or maybe you're in a retirement season and you say in this new season, work looks Totally different for me. Like, what's, what's my work? Some of you feel like you are preparing in the work that you're doing today for the work that you want to have someday. And some of you might even say, I, I feel like I'm working my dream job. Wherever it is that you might find yourself, right? Today we're gonna talk about this concept of work. The Bible tells us this, Colossians chapter three, verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's two areas that when I interact with and talk to people, that they either express their joy or they express their frustration. Probably two areas the most would be family. Guess what the second one is? <laughs> Work. Those areas in our lives that either bring us great joy or bring us great frustration. And I want to encourage you today, we're going to unpack a lot of scripture, but if we're going to... Look at it in a snapshot. Here's my encouragement to you today. When you think of your work, and especially when you think of what you want your life to look right, we're, we're talking, looking down the line, right? Reverse engineering. 
I'm gonna challenge you to do this. Be faithful in your work, and that, that word will make more sense here in just a moment. I wanna challenge you to be faithful. So, so we're gonna look at a passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is telling a parable. He's telling a story. And at the heart of his story is he is looking towards the end times. He's looking towards the, the moment when people will stand before Jesus at the kind of end of days in that judgment season that we read about in scripture. But what he talks about here actually really applies to everyday life. And I think especially when we talk about this idea of work. So Matthew 25, verse 14, here's the story that Jesus gives us. Jesus says again, it'll be like, and what he's talking about there is the kingdom of God will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who, received, who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Here's, here's what I want you to see. You've got these individuals that were given five and two and one, and they represent you and me in this story. And the things that they're doing in many ways represent the gifts that God has given to us, our talent, our resources, and then the work we do with it. And then we read this in verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold? See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, we, we come to this verse quite often, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Did you see that word faithful there a couple of times? Because what we're encouraged to be in our work is to be faithful. So today, looking at this scripture, and then we'll springboard off into other parts of the Bible, we're going to look at five characteristics of faithful work. Today, we're going to look at five characteristics of faithful work. We're going we're gonna to move fast, and we're going to cover a lot of ground. Some weeks, we take kind of one shorter passage of scripture, and we go deep. Today, we're, we're going we're gonna to move and cover a lot of different scriptures. We're actually going to look at kind of what, what you might call a theology of work. What does the Bible say about how we should view our work, how we should do our work? And so we're gonna look at five characteristics of faithful work. Here's the first one. Number one, faithful work is God's design. Number one, faithful work is God's design. The reality is, in this story, you have the master who goes away, and what, what are those that were entrusted with resources supposed to do? They're supposed to work with the things that they have been given from the very beginning, God's design for us was that we would work. Why is that? Well, here's, here's part of it. Look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the, and the earth. He's always creating, isn't he? He's always working. You see this in, in verse 2 of chapter 2 of Genesis. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. What's this tell us? Well, it tells us this. God is a worker, if you want to know what our God is like, one of the things that you'll see, is God lazy, yes or no? You better say no, he's listening, right? <laughs> God's a worker, right? And he, and he has created us to work as well. Now, these passages we're about to read are all in the context of when it talks about how God rested as well, right? And we'll, we'll come to that in another part of this series. We'll talk about this idea of rest, but look at what he says in Exodus 20, verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. So not only is there a day when we're supposed to rest, but it's understood that we will work and we will do labor as well because not only is God a worker, but look at this, we are created to work. You and I were created to create. We were made to work. We, we were created by God that meaningful things would be done by us. Here, here's another passage that helps us with this. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 11. Paul says, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business. Isn't it fun when you say it that way? Right, have you ever wanted to tell somebody that? It's right there in the Bible. You don't even have to tell them, just send them that first Thessalonians four eleven. they'll get it. You should mind your own business and work with your hands. I was just kidding about that, you know that, right? 
Don't, don't, don't do that. Okay. You, you should mind your own business. Work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. I love that passage of scripture because so many times I think when we think of our spiritual lives, we think that everything has to be from one high to the next, one exciting thing to the next, that we only live up here in this growth season, that everything is always up and to the right. And do you know what Paul says? Do you know what kind of life God, God desires for us? One where we do our work, where we mind our own business. What, what's the language that he uses here? To lead a quiet life. There's something beautiful about when we do our work and God is glorified through that in our lives. So we see here that the Bible has a lot to say about our work. Our work is important. Somebody once asked the great reformer Martin Luther how they could serve God. And Martin Luther said to them, well, what kind of work do you do now? And he said, well, I'm a, I'm a cobbler. I'm, I'm a shoemaker. I make shoes. Martin Luther looked at him and said, well, then make good shoes and sell them at a fair price. He did not say to him, make sure you make Christian shoes. He said, do your work, do it fair, do it with excellence, and God will be glorified. And so the first thing we see is that faithful work is a part of God's design. Here's the second thing we see, and we see it here in this story. Number two, that faithful work is done with integrity. Number two, faithful work is done with integrity, and if you're taking notes, make sure you kind of circle or underline or, 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 or focus in on that thought of that word integrity because it's critically important. Let's go back to the, the text, Matthew 25, 21. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So that word good that's there is talking about a moral quality, that he did good work. When we see it again here in just a moment, there's an there's a opposite servant we're going to see, and he's referred to as evil, as wicked, as lazy, but not this guy. This guy's a good servant. Why? Because he did good work. He did his work with integrity. We must do good work with integrity. And, and as we'll see here in just a moment, one of the keys, if you want your work to not only be a blessing to you, but also honoring to God is to do it with a high level of integrity. Proverbs chapter 10, verse nine. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. So not only do we wanna walk in integrity, I think we should work with integrity because when we work with integrity, our work is secure. So let me just give you just, just a few areas of integrity. We could, we could spell this out for a long time. Let me just give you a few that I think relate to our work in certain ways. Um, one of these is in Proverbs 21, 25. Proverbs 21, 25 says, the craving of a sluggard will be the death of him. Have you ever wanted to call anybody a sluggard? It's a great word. Just say it with me. Sluggard. Just kind of rolls off the tongue. The craving of a sluggard will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. The New Living Translation says it this way. Despite their desires, the lazy will come to ruin for their hands refuse to work. It's good for us to know laziness leads to ruin. And it feels good in the moment, but it catches up to us. You ever worked with anybody that was lazy? Anybody? I have. Never at Calvary Church, but I have. <laughs> right? And there's something that's, it's, it's irritating to you when you work with someone that's lazy. But I can even look back and see that this scripture is it's right. Laziness catches up to you at some point, right? That's not integrity. Let, let me give you another one. Look at this. Ephesians chapter four, verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Now, you ask, why does, why does Paul write this? Because when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he's writing to a group of people who are new believers. And in a culture that had very loose moral code, there were times when you would just do what you wanted to do to get what you wanted. And so he's saying to them, look, in the church as God's people, we're not like that. We, we live different. If you steal, here's, here's what he says, very simply, two words, stop stealing. <laughs> like, don't steal anymore. 
And I think we would all agree with that. But that area gets a little fuzzy. The U.S. Department of Defense, every few years, publishes a little book that they call the Encyclopedia of Ethical Failure. Right, And it's these case studies that they give of people who have done things, like it could be real crime, cheating scientists, drug dealers, rogue real estate agents, all these things that they use out of their departments to train people so that they know, hey, don't, don't do this. Here's one example, right? There was a, a guy who was a federal employee who backed his van up to the office one night and stole all of the department's computer equipment. And they were able to really figure out that it was him because a few weeks later, he had a yard sale. And during the yard sale, he sold all the equipment that was still marked with stickers that said, quote, property of the U.S. government. (laughs) Two other guys that were in the book never took vacation time. And they were trying to figure it out because they were gone sometimes, but they weren't using any of their vacation time. And then they looked and they saw when they were gone, the reason they were gone was for what was called religious compensatory time. They were like, well, that's weird. And they looked at the dates and none of their religious compensatory time lined up with any major religious holidays. But it did line up with all of their golf trips. And they asked the two guys, they said, "Um, do you think that a golf tournament could be considered a religious holiday? And the guy said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for some people it might. Of course you do, right? What they go on to say is that just about everybody in that book, when they got caught, when it was out there in front of them, their response was, I just don't know what I was thinking. There's these moments where we want something that's not ours. And if we're not careful, it'll lead us to do things we never thought we would do. Let let me give you a couple of more. Here's Philippians chapter two, verse 14. Paul, Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. What's, what's one of the easiest things for us to grumble and complain about? Isn't it our work? Right, and there's, a, there's an issue here at hand, I believe, that even though this isn't stealing and it might not be laziness, when we allow a critical spirit, a bad attitude, grumbling, complaining, arguing to come into our minds and then into our vocabulary, it limits the ways that God can bless us in the workplace. There's an old saying, I I think it goes back to, to John Maxwell, it's a little cheesy, but it says your attitude determines your altitude. Have you ever heard this? It's cheesy, but I remember it. Because the reality is, if I want to soar, it's hard to do it with a bad attitude. In every area of our lives, I I can tell you stories of people that I have watched and seen in the workplace. I can actually tell you a lot of stories about people in ministry who allowed grumbling and complaining to become their default mode, and it limited the things that God could do in and through their lives. It's a breach of our integrity. Let me, let me give you just one more here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Anybody ever quoted that to your teenager? <laughs> the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. If you need it, use it. Verse 11. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire tire of doing what is good. You know what was happening in Thessalonica when Paul wrote this? There were people who had said, well, Jesus is coming back. And so I'm just gonna wait for Jesus. I'm not gonna do any kind of earthly work because I'm just so spiritual, I'm just gonna wait here for Jesus to come back. And you know what Paul said? Get to work, he said. (laughs) He says, if you're not gonna work, you're, you're not gonna eat. He says, the problem is you were created to do things, and when you stop doing things, when you stop being busy, you become a busy body. He says, be busy, not a busy body. Fulfill that calling that's in your life and do it with integrity. Here's here's why, and I want you to see something. Oftentimes, I think we have a tendency to think that if we're in an area of growth, 
the way we end up in an area of failing is because we do like a counterclockwise circle and we kind of, first we, we move into grace and then we get into flat and we eventually find ourselves in failing. But the reality is, if you, if you look and you think about it, this is a very thin line. I, I think there's a thin line between growth and failing. And here's the reason why. I've known a lot of people who have been here and find themselves here because on this side of this line, I think what we have is integrity. But when our integrity becomes compromise, that gravity of life that we talked about last week pulls us down, and it's a real thin line to get from here to here. When you compromise your integrity, you jeopardize the growth in your life. Does that make sense? So like we have to guard our integrity, especially in the workplace, because when that line gets crossed, we quickly find ourselves there when we wanna be in a place of God's blessing. So faithful work is work that is done with integrity, which takes us to the third thing. Num- number three, faithful work is fruitful work. Faithful work is fruitful work. Oftentimes when we use the word faithful, we, we have this tendency to think that what we're talking about is you just show up, you're consistent, you're there. And yet this story in Matthew 25 about the servants and the bags of gold, the talents, is this story that we know has a whole lot more to do with what we produce in our lives than just that we show up. Look at this. Matthew 25, 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Why is he calling him faithful? Because you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. But if you go one verse before, right? That's verse 21. But go to verse 20. Why was the guy faithful? Because the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. He didn't just hold on to those five bags. He wasn't just consistent. He couldn't just be counted on. You know what he did? He took what he had and he was busy doing what God had called him to do. And out of that work, he created even more. The reality is fruitfulness is a sign of faithfulness, right? You you can call someone faithful But if you don't see fruit coming out in their lives, then there's a good chance that they're not as faithful as what you think they might be, right? Here's here's how this story plays out, right? Later in this same story, you got the guy with five bags. He created five more, took those 10, and gets the well done, good, and faithful servant. We'll skip it, but there's a guy with two bags. He creates two more. He brings those four to the master, and he also gets the well done, good, and faithful servant. And then there's this guy, verse 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and, and, and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. And see, here, here is what belongs to you. You know what this dude, he played it safe, but he was in a place where his life looked awful. What, anybody help me? <laughs> Flat. Right, he just didn't do anything. Right, sometimes there's wisdom that we need to have, but when we just play it safe, we find ourselves in a place that's flat. So look at what we read, verse 26. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Does that sound like good and faithful? <laughs> no, very different. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then, you should have put your money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. He's like, it's the least you could have done. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When when we get back into the book of Matthew, we'll dig a little bit more into the meaning behind those words weeping and gnashing of teeth. But just real real quick, quick poll. Anybody want to avoid weeping and gnashing of teeth? Say amen. Amen. All right, so what what does that tell us? Well, there's a real line that's drawn here between this guy who played it safe, this, this guy who didn't do anything with what he had, and the person who lives in a place of grace. See here, what I think you're gonna see is fruitfulness. We've talked about that, right? There's going to be something coming out of your life, but there's a thin line between grace and flat. 
Like in those different seasons, I think there's a thin line here. And what's different in these moments is when you give in to apathy. When you become apathetic in your work, you jeopardize those seasons of grace in your life. Right? You, you can have an apple tree that looks good, but if it doesn't produce any apples, no matter how green it is, no matter how tall it is, if it's an apple tree and it doesn't produce any apples, what good is it? In fact, the Bible says that every tree that does not bear fruit will be timber, right? It's gonna be cut down. And so if you're in a place in your life where your work life is described by being discontent or apathetic or fruitless, it might be time to reevaluate. Now look, I, I, don't, I don't wanna frustrate anybody because there will be seasons where you're waiting. Have you ever found that? Like there's seasons where you go, well, I wish I was some, I'm here, but I wish I was somewhere else. I'm doing this, but I wish I was doing something else. I'm preparing, but I'm preparing because I wanna do something else. And sometimes there's seasons where you work hard for a long time before you see the fruit that you want to see. Anybody ever been there? You, you plant an apple tree, does it have a massive harvest the first year, yes or no? <laughs> no. But what's happening is the whole time there's something that's growing, there's something that's moving. So don't get confused because sometimes seasons of waiting and working look like apathy to other people. But you know when you're being faithful and you know when you're preparing to be fruitful and you know when God is working that out. And let me show you this, the last verse again, Matthew 25, 29 says, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Please know this, that today's faithfulness leads to tomorrow's fruitfulness. So stay faithful, stay focused on that work. Don't give up, don't become apathetic, don't become lazy. Don't let either apathy or compromise bring you to a point where your integrity and fruitfulness is questioned because God wants to bless you. Well, that's real good preaching, preacher you work at the church. In fact, you only work on Sundays. <laughs> what do you know? Well, I can tell you, on at least three occasions, I've been in places in my life where I just said, I don't know if I can do this anymore, and I don't know if I wanna do this anymore. And I've just had to say, God, will you help me? And he walks us through those seasons of transitions. And there are times, I know, it's hard, right? Work is one of the most difficult things in many of our lives. Look, and some of you go, well, Chad, I just have a job I hate. Like, it may be that moment. Look, here's the thing. If you are in a job and you know that that is not God's place for you, you, you just know it, you're working it, but you know that's not God's place for you, then can I encourage you to bring yourself to a place where you say, God, I give my job to you. I entrust this to you that you will lead me to the places that you have in store. What I'm not encouraging you to do is quit tomorrow. All right, everybody turn to the person on your left and say, don't quit tomorrow. Go ahead, give it to the guy on the right too. They might need it. Because I've said things like this before. And then people come to me and said, I quit. You quit. Why? Because you told me to, Pastor. I did not. Because in this season, God may have given you that insurance. And God may have given you that compensation. And God may have given you this testing ground for your faithfulness. So look, if you're in a job that you hate and you don't think it's where God has you, ask him to take you where he wants you to be. If you are in a place that you hate and God has you there, then be faithful. And if you're not sure, just flip a coin. <laughs> no, if you're not sure, be faithful. Like work with all your heart. Like continue to do the things that God has put in front of you today. Because if you want God to trust you with something bigger today, you know what, or tomorrow, do you know what he needs to see from you today? Faithfulness in your life, which takes us into this next thing, number, number four, number four. Faithful work is spiritual. Faithful work is spiritual. I think we have a tendency a lot of times to think that church is the spiritual part of our lives and work is the work part of our lives. But I want you to see 
Your work is just as spiritual or more so than any other part of your life. What does Jesus tell us to do? Matthew chapter five, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Have you ever heard that before? And then Galatians chapter five talks to us. We read this last week about the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, read, read this one with me, Galatians five twenty-two. But the fruit of the Spirit is, go ahead and read this with me, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we have talked about being the light of the world, and we've talked about having the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Do you know when I, when I talk to people, the two places of either joy or frustration in their lives, where they talk to me, it's either their family or their work. And can I challenge you, it is with our family and at work that we most shine our lights and reveal the Spirit's fruit. Isn't that true? Like, cool. Tell me you love Jesus in the atrium. And awesome. Show joy to somebody in the parking lot here. Please show joy to people in the parking lot here. But if I really wanna see your light shine, if you really wanna know if the Holy Spirit's fruit is growing in you, it's probably gonna happen about two o'clock tomorrow on your job. It's gonna happen in those everyday moments. I, I wanna challenge you, this is a little bit of the, the thing that we see here in, in these two sides, right? We, we showed this last week, but these, these top two, grace and growth, that's God's way of doing things. We, we find ourselves flat when we do things in our ways. That's, that's when we're failing, right? So here's my challenge to you, remember this, you're still a Christian at work. <laughs> Monday through Friday, you're nine to five. Raising those kids or trying to figure out what it looks like to be retired. You're still a Christian in those moments. And some of you say, well, Chad, what do I do? And, and I'll, give you, I'll give you some thoughts like rapid fire, right? Just some thoughts to talk about our spirituality of our work. Some of you go, well, Chad, what do I do if I have a bad boss? Well, Paul knew you were gonna ask that. And so in Ephesians chapter six, he writes to who he refers to as slaves, and if, you, and if you go and you look at the context of the first century, slaves were more like indentured servants. There's a lot to unpack there, but basically there's some principles there that apply to you and I when we work, especially when we work with a bad boss. Listen to this, Ephesians chapter six, verse five. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. We read this passage at the beginning of every staff meeting at Calvary. Um, <laughs> no, we don't, no, we don't, no, we don't. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do whether they are slave or free. Now, there's a lot to say about injustice, and there's a lot to say about mistreatment, but what Paul says here is, remember, when you do your work, you're actually working for Christ. Right. So that applies even if you have a bad boss. What happens if you don't have a bad boss? What happens if you are the bad boss? Because some of you are in leadership roles. I had a guy walk up to me after the last service, and he just said, I needed to hear that today. I just got a promotion and it's challenging me. God's word is challenging me in the way I've, I've got to think about this. Some of you own your own business. What's, what's that mean? Look at this. Paul says this in the very next verse, Ephesians 6, 9. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no favoritism with him. Like, so the way that we treat one another, the way that we view our work, it's all tied up. It's It's spiritual. I read an interesting quote from a guy, um, his name is Tim McGuire. He was the former editor of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And he was given a talk called Faith, Religion, and Values. And, and there's a line in here that just grabbed me. Listen to this. He says, work is brutal. Anybody ever felt that way? He says, work is a four-letter word. Most people don't think that work could possibly have anything to do with spirituality. They assume that these two worlds cannot mesh. But if we bring our souls to work, I love that line. When was the last time that I, that I thought about, that you thought about the fact that my soul is a part of my work? But if we bring our souls to work, then we can transform our work. That is where our work can begin to transform us. The problem for most people is that their work transforms them into something bad, something bitter and tired and broken. 
So can I challenge you? Take your soul to work. Like imagine that your work is not just this practical thing. It's not just a paycheck. It, it is a part of your spiritual life. And you say, well, Chad, I gotta work with people who are unlovable. I gotta work with people who are unsaved. I, I gotta work in an environment where there's words that I shouldn't say in church. And I see and hear things that aren't good for my spiritual life. Some of you work in environments where you literally, before you step in the door, you need to do spiritual warfare. Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God. Everything from protecting your eyes to guarding your heart to making sure that your your steps are taken with integrity. Maybe it's important for you to, to come to a place where you pray before, during, and after your work. And by prayer, what I mean is that you're constantly asking the Lord, Lord, would you help me? I bring my soul to work in this place with that person in this situation. God, I I just need your help. Maybe what rolls off your lips is Psalm 19, 14. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Why does this matter? Well, because your work is a mission field. Right, we'll talk in a couple of weeks about how God sends out certain people to be missionaries, to go to unreached people groups. But are there unreached people at your work? Yes or no? There's a few at mine. Is there any unreached, any unreached, sorry, sorry, Beshke, I wasn't talking about you. Unreached people? Yes, there are, right? Your work is a mission field. It's not just your money, it's not just your influence. And know this as you go in there. I know it's rapid fire, but your work is not your identity. It's real easy for all of us to start to think that who we are is what we do. Because what what do people usually ask us? What's one of the first things they want to know? Hey, what do you do? Where do you work? What's your job? And we start to think that our whole identity is tied up in what we do and the job we have or the job we don't have and the success we have or the success we don't have. And what happens with all of this is it starts to be weary on our soul. So can I just give you a word of encouragement? Be careful that a bad day at work does not cause you to be an angry spouse, distracted parent, or lousy friend. Be careful that a bad day at work does not cause you to be an angry spouse or a distracted parent or a lousy friend. You probably haven't, but I've been guilty of that. Like you have those days, and whatever happened at work, it it sets the tone for how you go into your house. Years ago, a friend gave me a good piece of advice. He said, I have a stop sign about a mile from my house. And he said, I've just gotten in the habit, especially on rough days, that when I get to that stop sign, I stop And I say, Lord, there were things from this day that I don't want to take into my house. So I'm going to leave them here. And I can pick them up in the morning. But I don't want those things to affect me as a parent or as a spouse or as a friend. And that wasn't enough for me. But God has a sense of humor. So about about a mile from my house, there's this stretch where you lose all cell signal. I don't know why about a quarter of a mile. But oftentimes when I drive through there, if I'm on the phone, it cuts out. If I'm listening to a podcast, sometimes it gets weird because there's this little spot where the Lord helps me to remember, you really should leave it there, grumpy. Does the Lord ever call you grumpy or just me? He says, you really should leave it there. So here's my encouragement, especially those of you that still have really impressionable lives in your home. After the worst day at work, Try to bring your best self home. After the worst day at work, try to bring your best self home. Because actually, your work is spiritual. Which takes us one last thing, number five. Number five, faithful work is worship. Number five, faithful work is worship. How how does Paul say it? Colossians chapter three, verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And can I tell you this? When you let your work be worship, you're reminded of this too. Like God God wants you to win. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to know his help. He wants you to know his strength. So honor God with your work. 
Whatever it is in this season for you, whatever it looks like, honor God with your work and know that what we are working for is this. Matthew 25, 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So there was a guy who did a ton of business travel. So he was flying all the time. And one day he was on a flight and uh, he noticed, I don't think I've ever had service like this on a flight before. These flight attendants are giving me the absolute best service, not just me, but the whole, the whole plane that I've ever seen. They are attentive, they are kind, they're, they're doing everything by the book and yet they're making everybody feel special and he, he's just, he was just overwhelmed by how good the service was on this flight. And so as they were getting ready to land, he, he called over one of the flight attendants and he says, I, I know this might be kind of weird. I, ho- I hope you understand why I'm sharing this with you. He says, but, but I just want you to know, I travel a lot and I've never been with a flight crew like this before. He says, you, you all are clearly the most attentive. You are the kindest. This, everybody should be, have the privilege to fly with a group like you. You do an awesome job. And I just, I just want to say thank you. And the flight attendant leaned real close to him and she whispered, she says, don't thank us and don't turn around, but you need to thank the lady in seat 12B behind you because she works for the airline. <laughs> and she's in charge of all the flight attendants. And today is our evaluation. We hope you have a pleasant trip. And she turned and walked away. Would your work be any different if Jesus was physically sitting with you at your desk? If he showed up on the line at the factory or was sitting in the dining room while you were raising your kids? If if you knew he was there and that someday you'd have to answer for how you live today, would you live your work any different today? Because the reality is he is here Someday I'm going to have to, you're going to have to answer for the work that we do. And I just want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? And I want to pray about our work for a minute. And some of you are saying, Chad, my work is not the issue. It's, it's, it's my whole life. But I'm trying to do it all on my own. And today when you talked about integrity, I know I need forgiveness. And Jesus came to be our savior. He's the one who can bring you that forgiveness. He's he's the son of God who came and lived a sinless life and died on the cross to pay the price for your sins and my sins. Scripture says that if you will call on the name of the Lord, you can be saved. And your savior can bring you forgiveness today. And maybe you're saying, well, Chad, I just, my, my life feels fruitless. And I feel like I'm lacking purpose that same Jesus who died rose again and he lives today to give you life and give you meaning and give you purpose and today if you'd simply just say in this room auditorium to watching on a screen somewhere listening to this podcast if you would just say Jesus I can't do it on my own anymore I give you my life that's the first step towards knowing a life of freedom and forgiveness and purpose that can only come from him so today if you just would simply say Jesus I give you my life you just raise your hand and put it right back down you know who you are in this room yeah thanks thanks whether it's the first time or the thousandth time if you just need to say today jesus i give you my life anybody else i want to pray with you today yeah thanks thanks and as we pray today i also know that for some of you as we talked about work today for whatever reason this was maybe a difficult difficult conversation because there's, there's areas in your life and there's areas in your work where you just need God's help in a very real way. And I'm not gonna ask you to stand or, or raise a hand. I'm just gonna ask you in your heart to say, God, would you help me in my work? Just right now, in your heart. As we pray, Father, we come to you. And Lord, thanks that not only are you a worker, but you've created each one of our lives with purpose and meaning. We are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which you prepared for us today. And so Lord, I I pray for my friends today. 
those that, that are finding great purpose and meaning in their work, would you continue to equip them? Would you continue to, to give them opportunity and show them the ways that you're working through them to bring fruit? And Lord, some of us today are overwhelmed by our work. We're frustrated by our work. We feel like that thing in our lives that just isn't moving forward is our work. Lord, maybe we feel flat or failing in this moment. Lord, I ask that right now you would would begin something as we genuinely reach out to you. Lord, that our souls would come with us to work, that we would spiritually see you, even in environments where it seems like, God, you're you're not even welcome. Lord, would we spiritually see you at work in our life and in the lives of others? Lord, would you bless our work that as we faithfully work for you, we're gonna see the fruit of that in our lives, in the fruit of the spirit in our lives and the way that you provide and you bless and you work through us. Lord, each one of us need to hear something special and different from you, Holy Spirit. So would you let your words sink deep and lead us in our work this week, we pray. Lord, send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for being here today. Have a great week at work. We'll see you next Sunday.